passage in this in this um, disc, in, in this discussion of this really interesting, not only interesting but really important event, um, process, which is happening, which has already started in Chile. And so I'm David Lehman. I'm um, a friend of the Institute of the Americas, and I'm a retired Cambridge academic. And I'm going to hand over to Carla Moscoso, who is also a Cambridge person. She's a Cambridge doctoral candidate, and she works for the Comité de para la Prevención de la Tortura in Chile. So I will hand over to Carla, and she will introduce our two speakers, Cristina Dorador and Fernando Atria, who I'm, I want to welcome and also thank for their participation. Carla. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having here today. Um, let me introduce you to Cristina Dorador. She's professor in the Department of Biotechnology at the University of Antofagasta in the north of Chile, uh, specializing in microbiology. I'm, I'm not sure if I can pronounce this. So Cristina, you can correct me. Geomicrobiology and limnology. <laughs> Um, she's also being elected with the largest vote in her district for the non-party Movimiento Independiente del Norte um, in the list with the most votes in the district. So welcome, Cristina. Um, Fernando Atria, uh, he's professor at the Law Faculty of University of Chile, um, specializing in constitutional law. Uh, he received the most votes in his district here in Santiago de Chile uh, in the list of the Frente Amplio Coalition. Um, he's also president of the Progressive Fuerza Común movement. Uh, this movement is part of the Frente Amplio Coalition. So thank you, Fernando, for being here today. Thank you, Carla. So let's start with a question for you both. Uh, Cristina and Fernando. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on your election as constituents. Um, having said that, uh, I'd like to know um, what was your motivation for standing as a candidate for the convention? Uh, and also, what's your opinion regarding the political composition of the convention? Considering that for many analysts, the outcomes of the election were quite shocking in terms of the presence of independence. So I'd like to know your opinion about this. We can start with Christina. Well, thanks Carla for the introduction. Also, thanks to everybody here. And I'm very happy to, to share a little bit about what's happening in Chile right now in this uh, very exciting times so for the new constitution. Well, I, I'm, I'm as a scientist, um, I have been involved in, in, in different numbers of, uh, of subjects regarding environmental issues and also in the politics for gender equality. Um, I have been part of, for example, of the Chile National Council for Science and Technology. Uh, from this work, I realized how, how important it is to have policies that support the development of science in the region outside Santiago because the, the system is very centralized. I also realized that, uh, for example, a scientific paper themselves are not enough to take decisions based on evidence. For example, I have studied some very special um, ecosystem called Salares, which are saline lakes in the Andes. And currently these systems are endangered because of the lithium extraction for batteries. So it is a paradox that under a frame of sustainability and electromobility, these fragile aquatic ecosystems are also severely affected. I'm a scientist activist uh, in a mining region, and I received the most votes, as Carla mentioned, for a candidate in, in the region. So this is very important. Also that uh, social rights, uh, such as education, housing, health, and other issues are, uh, should be guaranteed in the new constitution. Also, the human right to water is fundamental together with the discussion about rights of nature, protection of biodiversity, and the right to live in a healthy environment. So regarding the composition of the assembly is very diverse. So I think that is uh, super important now to, to set up the discussion. We need to also um, 
understands that, that this diversity is not only human diversity, it's also people coming from different part of, of the country, that um, many of them are yeah, coming from uh, indigenous uh, communities. So we are in a, in a main challenge uh, that includes understand to the interculturality and also um, interdisciplinarity maybe. So um, I think it's very healthy for a country to, to finally that people are, are represented uh, in this uh, assembly that will write the new constitution. Not um, just the same group that ever than in, the, in, the, in the last time have uh, write all the laws and maybe with a very tight vision about what really means uh, to live in a country like Chile. Thank you, Cristina. Fernando? Well, thank you, Carla, and thank you, David, for, for this uh, invitation to talk to you about us, uh, of what is happening in Chile, as Cristina said, says. Um, it's, it, these are very exciting times in political and constitutional terms in Chile. And your question is a, is a, is a very uh, relevant question. Um, in my view, what we, we have been seeing since October 2000, and 19 in Chile is the development um, of what constitutional theory calls a constituent power. Um, the, 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 the constitutional process, the constituent process that is now underway uh, started with what is now called the outburst, outburst or the re, uh, revolt of October 2019, and that opened the way for uh, something that had been impossible for the, for the previous 30 years. That is a real process of changing uh, our current constitution. Uh, and, and that, uh, the, the force that exploded that day in October uh, was channeled through, or was attempted to be channeled through this institutional process, uh, the first moment of which was this agreement uh, of uh, November the 15th uh, of the same year. Um, and, and, and this process as originally designed had a series of uh, flaws or elements that uh, to many people uh, created an impression that it was yet another attempt to neutralize a real possibility for change. Well, and this is what I say we are, we are witnessing the development of a constituent process, a power, because since November 2019 uh, and up to now, what we have seen is that most of those, I mean, I would say all of those elements that could arouse suspicion as to the real possibility for change in this constituent process, all those elements have been in one way or another corrected. So first, the, the first criticism of the terms of the institutional process was uh, that the constitutional convention would be more or less a, uh, uh, um, a, a mirror image of the traditional in representative institutions like Congress, uh, which were of course uh, radically delegitimized. De um, uh, and then, uh, the, the rules for the composition of the convention change in order to make it 50-50 uh, in terms of men and women. And then they were changed again in order to secure representation of indigenous people. And then they were uh, uh, changed again in order to secure uh, representation of what we call independence, i.e. people who are organized, but they don't look to political parties to channel their uh, political participation. Um, and then in the election, to get to your question, and in the election, the last two elements that would still uh, cause uh, trouble were first, the fact that those uh, non-party uh, candidates would not be elected because of the operation of the electoral system and so on. They would get, I and mean, this was the, um, the, 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 the view that was common before the election, that these movements would get a significant portion of the vote, but because of the operation of the electoral system, they would not be represented in the constitutional convention. 
And the fact that that was not the case and that they got a significant representation, it's one of the, in my view, one of the major achievements of the constituent process. And the other, of course, the other significant aspect of this election was that the, the anticipation that the right-wing parties who have defended the current constitution for the last 30 years would get a, a, a portion of uh, the convention that would allow, the, uh, allow them to veto any constitutional decision that they wouldn't like, that also failed. And then didn't get a significant share in those terms of the convention. So we have now a convention that is uh, much, much more representative and is seen as much more representative of the Chilean people as the traditional representative bodies because of the inclusion of people not linked to political parties on the one hand, and we have a convention in which no group or sector has the, uh, the strength of unilaterally veto any decision of the convention. These two elements, which are the, re the direct result of the election and the composition of the con constitutional convention are in my view, the two elements that uh, justify a considerable optimism respect, respecting the, the, the outcome of the, the, the constitutional process. Thank you. Can I, can I move back to Christina, please? Christina, you mentioned two things in your introduction. One is the environment and the other is interculturalidad. Can you tell us how you think the environment, the new constitution will protect the environment? What sort of measures, what sort of laws, what sort of provisions can it do which would, if, which would um, achieve this? Yeah, this is a, a main a main subject. Um, well, we are in a, in a in a very important moment, not only political for Chile, but also in in a global context. We are living a major climatic uh, crisis, no? and Chile will be one of the country most affected because of the of the climate change. We are not, of course, the one that produces more carbon dioxide, but we are the one uh, will suffer a lot of problems, especially with the um, aridity or, or the certification and others. So water is a, is a is main, main, main subject here. So first, uh, I think we have to start from the perspective of human rights. So the, the new constitution should guarantee, of course, the strict respect of human rights. Uh, together with this, it's important to consider it as well a, a new ethics regarding the, the link between humans and environment. So we have an indissoluble connection uh, with nature and the constitution should have nature at its center. That is also something that we promote uh, from the beginning of, the, of, of this process. We are uh, proposing to create a, a ecological constitution uh, where the rights of nature and other aspects will, will produce necessarily a change in the, in the economical model. That is, I think it's also one of the most challenging things uh, that will promote this um, eco ecological constitution. Because currently, uh, Chilean economy is based on extractivism, for example, mining, fisheries, uh, agriculture, and others. So to go beyond, it is important also to develop science and technology, and especially all kind of knowledge from the territories, from the regions. Because for other side, these aspects are, are centralized as well. 70% are, are of the research and, and development is happening in, only in Santiago, and, and, and regions have this um, this is stigma to be only productive areas. So I think from the point of view of the ecological constitution, we can also move to a different economic model, but also uh, about the decentralization that we already talked a little bit about and other aspects that are crucial for to, that, that, to, to to be in, in, in front of this, this, this future scenarios, especially based on the climate crisis. crisis. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question. <laughs> Fernando, um, so you're a specialist in law. So can you tell us how the convention will work? Um, 
your uh, what administrative support it will have and how it is expected to incorporate citizens in the discussion process. Um, you, you have been thinking about this. Uh, have you got a kind of uh, rule? Can you tell us about that, please? Thank you, Carla. May, may I just add a note about uh, the issue of the environment uh, mm -hmm. before, uh, uh, go, go. Uh, apropos of what Cristina was saying. Uh, the current constitution, I mean, the, 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 the present constitution guarantees what it calls the right to live in a clean environment. And this is, this is, uh, uh, the, 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 this is part of our current constitution. But this, this right uh, has not had any significant impact uh, for uh, econ economic development, um, the economic activity, as Christina was saying. And, and, and this fact that there is a constitutional provision guaranteeing uh, the right to live in a clean environment, but that has not materialized in uh, particularly environmentally uh, conscious or friendly economic activity, adds a cautionary uh, note to the power of constitutional declarations. Um, and this, in my view, should be one of the major concerns of the new uh, constitution, not only to uh, declare, for example, uh, that um, uh, 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 environmental sustainability is relevant. I mean, it's not only relevant, it's one major concern of all uh, the organization of economic activity and so on. I mean, this, of course, those declarations are important, but in order to realize those declarations, the constitution needs to create power, political power, uh, a power that is strong uh, is, is, is strong enough to face uh, economic interests, because I, in my view, that's the main problem of the current constitution. That it does not it, it, it was designed not to create uh, power strong enough to face uh, capital, uh, and so that's the reason why, regardless of those in interesting declarations concerning the right to live in a clean environment, those declarations are compatible with the fact that they are areas of, of Chile, which are uh, literally poisoned uh, um, and so on. Uh, regarding the working of the constitutional convention, this is, this is something that we'll be tackling the first part of the constituent process when, when the convention has to approve its uh, regulations, its, its reglamento. Um, uh, I think that, uh, that that reglamento will have to address uh, of course, many issues. One of them particularly relevant will be uh, the way in which uh, the convention will work towards securing uh, participation. And, and this is a crucial uh, issue for the legitimacy of the new constitution. If the convention is seen as working in the same way as Congress and other institutions that are the cause of the problem we have now, then the constitution will be seen as, well, something uh, not particularly, I mean, something as we have seen all those e these years. So, I mean, it's, it's in my view crucial for the new constitution that, that the convention is seen as open and receptive uh, to, politic, to, to participation of uh, people in general. Uh, and we are uh, discussing um, at this point informally, of course, and from uh, next Monday, probably in a more formal way, we will, we, we will be discussing precisely uh, how those mechanisms, how, how will be, what, what will, will be those mechanisms of political participation of, uh, so to ensure that the discussion in the convention, the, what we could call the institutional discussion, uh, will mirror and will be seen as mirroring the social discussion of the new constitution that is actually now currently occurring uh, uh, everywhere, basically, uh, in different forms of organizations and meetings and citizens' uh, uh, arrangements and so on. This, this is one of the, of the critical, in my view, critical points uh, for the success of the constituent process. Well, thank you. Tommy, Christina, do you, do you envisage some sort of independent institution in the new in the new constitution which would protect 
human rights and the environment. That is, a, in, that is to say, a, a, something like a Supreme Court, but independent of the executive and indeed of the legislative, because otherwise these things get, well, you tell us, they get subject to the conflicts of interest and so on. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think maybe maybe Fernando knows more than me about the, the legal part, but I think the the um, all the problems that will happen during the, the discussion of the convention will be treated by the Supreme Court. No, I'm right, Fernando. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. About Sorry, what was the question? Not sure. <laughs> what was the question? No, no, if, because if there are some controversies and between the, the convention or something that people are not agree, that could be also come to the legal part, no? That is a, it's a Supreme Court, right? Yeah, yeah but I, was, I meant in, in the yeah. new constitution. Yeah, in the new constitution, well, it's something that we have to discuss. I think, yeah, could be an independent organ uh, that, that uh, guarantee the the complete of this uh, most important regulation that are human rights. But I, I, I haven't really think about it, no. Mm. So the last question for you both uh, before open the questions. So Cristina and Fernando, you both represent a left-wing political sensitivity. I'd like to know how you see the right wing's role regarding this process, uh, considering the political weakness uh, in which they are now. Um, what's your opinion about that? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I said something in my first uh, answer uh, to, to this particular point. I, I think that the, the expectations of, of the right-wing parties were to, uh, to, to get uh, a one third plus one uh, participation in the constitutional convention that would allow them to block any any provisions that they wouldn't like, uh, because the convention is subject to a two thirds rule, right? Um, um, and and they failed to get that. Uh, they failed to get that. So so now they they are faced. And, and in fact, actually, this is a question for them rather than for us. No, but they are faced with. Uh, the decision, if they go to the convention in the same uh, uh, attitude with it, which they have had in the in all the constitutional discussion up to now, uh, in which everything that is not neoliberal orthodoxy is North Korea, right? Uh, uh, if, if that's their attitude, well, instead of blocking constitutional provisions, since they don't have the strength, they will be marginalized, self-marginalized, right? They will be left outside and they will see from that particular point how the rest will go on advancing towards a new constitution. So I would expect that they would try to avoid that and instead adopt a different attitude, one of open, op uh, one of, of, of uh, uh, of, of, of willingness to discuss uh, the content of the new constitution in a different uh, frame. If they do this, of course, they will be participants in the discussion and they will have the impact in the new constitution that, they, their, that their ideas will have to, will be able to, and so on. But I, I think that uh, uh, this is, of course, a question of, of, of their political strategy for the convention, which should be answered by them. I suppose that uh, the, the, the strategy of insisting in their neoliberal orthodoxy, um, uh, they will quickly see that that strategy will take them, take them nowhere and that they will have to change the, the strategy. And since they have a significant power in, 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 in the control of the media and so on, the fact that they open to, a, they accept to, to, to open from their point of view, the constitutional discussion uh, will, will also be uh, uh, um, uh, good news for, for the constituent process. The, the, 
in my view, the constitutional discussion in Chile has not been able to get started because of this, because they, they try to portray everything that is not orthodox in neoliberal terms uh, as if it were a kind of mad leftist, ultra leftist, uh, uh, absurd idea that would take us to uh, Venezuela or, as I said, uh, North Korea. But I, I, I would anticipate that from their point of view, that, that would lead us lead, lead them nowhere and that will change. Well, thank you. Do we open now for discussion, Carla? Yeah, definitely. So will... We have many questions. David. Yes, so the first question comes from, um, I'm just going in the order in which they came in. Um, from Michael Gatehouse of the Latin America Bureau. Mike, can you unmute? Yes, I have. Good. Uh, I'll run video as well. Yes, let's see your face. Yeah, hi. Uh, shall I read my question? Yeah. It's, it's three parts. What okay. is the product of the constituent process? Is it simply the text? of the new constitution. Secondly, once you've written it, does, will it envisage processes other than or beyond traditional lawmaking in Congress? Uh, for instance, Asambleas Populares at a local level or something of the sort. And thirdly, in the meantime, while you're writing the constitution, how are the members of the convention working Presumably many or most of you have other jobs and responsibilities. Does the convention have a secretariat? If so, who controls it? And also during this year or however long it is that it takes to draft the new constitution, how will you involve and keep on board and keep involved uh, those who voted for you and voted for this whole very different and radical process. What's to stop them becoming demobilized, bored, or just uh, not know what's going on? Well, um, um, no. Christina. Christina. Okay. Thanks, Mike, for the question. Uh, regarding the first one, uh, it's not just the text on your constitution. That will be, of course, the the, the material product, but also I think in this case it's very important the process because it's something inedit that we have lived in Chile, and it's uh, also changing. Finally, uh, the, uh, all the residue that we still have from the dictatorship, in a way that people really feel that this is the moment to to participate and, and to give uh, all their. Um, their issues and, 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 and dreams that they have for the new country. So also this is a, it's a cultural moment. We, we, maybe we cannot uh, analyze now because it's happening, but probably in the future when we look backwards, we will see um, how this have connected people finally. I really think that uh, it's, it's, it's changing. Now it's, people really are interested in the process, really want to participate. It's something that I have never, never have seen before. And also when we were in campaign, um, most, many people didn't know what's happening, but all they know was very, very interesting. They organized themselves in assembleas, in, in, in different uh, small uh, organization or group to try to, to give their ideas. So I think it's, it's, it's beyond the, the text. It will be clearly a, a, a deeper change for Chile. Regarding the second one, um, well, once the new constitution is written, what happened? Well, um, that's also a, it's a very important uh, challenge for the regulation, the, the reglamento, that have to be written soon and include the, the, the different ways of participate uh, in, in, this, uh, in this process. Because also, um, this is key. This is something, something key. The, the sample is not only uh, formed by, by us, of course, it's a diverse range of person and, and an indigenous. Uh, communities, so each group have also different way of participation, a different form of participation. Um, I think we need to have the main main effort to try to 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 go to every corner of of the country uh, to get the message of, of the people. So and um, and the third one, um, 
I think legally we need, we need to dedicate 100% to the to this job. So in, in our case, we are, I mean, I live in my case, I'm academic. I'm, I'm taking the like a sabbatical <laughs> to dedicate 100% to this uh, this process. And other person have other realities, but in general, we we, we already seen that it will be a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Uh, so we need to put all <laughs> as we can, our soul and, and body to to this. Uh, this is to have finally a good um, a good text for the constitution. You're taking a sabbatical on full pay. <laughs> no, no. The, the assembly uh, will have a, a payment for every member. So oh, no, but universities, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We are poor country. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She she's take, taking a third world view. Uh, third world form sabbatical. Of sabbatical yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we have many questions, so Fernando could uh, answer the next one. Uh, Tom Brake, is it Tom here? Yes, yes I am. Uh, thank Tom, you. Uh, you, can, you can make the, the question yourself. Thank you, thank you Carla. Um, so my, my question, or there are two questions and I'll start perhaps with the second one in the chat and that is how do you decide what you want to have in the constitution because surely the more things that you want to put in it, the greater risk is that you won't actually agree the content. And the second question is more a UK focused one. Uh, the organization that I'm a director of Unlock Democracy campaigns for a written constitution in the United Kingdom. So we're looking in amazement at what's happening in Chile and wonder whether there are any lessons that we can learn here about how you, is it possible to create an interest in uh, securing a written constitution where there isn't a big trigger like what happened in Chile in 2019 that perhaps pushes that process forward? Well, who wants to start? What is, I think, um, Fernando, what, uh, what is included and what is not included? Is there any limit? to what can be included in the constitution? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, th there are some limits, uh, some, some formal limits, but there are limits that in my view uh, are not real limits in, 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 in any political, politically relevant sense. For example, let me put you an example. Uh, the rules that apply to the convention says that the new constitution can must respect the democratic organization of Chile, Chile's democratic organization and the, and, the, and the Republican form. So for example, if there, if there is an initiative to, uh, to, to, to give Chile a monarchical form, uh, that would be excluded. But you see, you see why I, say, I am saying that it, it, there are limits, but there are no limits in, in reality, because that's, that's conceptually a limit, something that cannot be decided. But it's something that no one can, can no, 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 no one is, is, is pushing for. So, so, uh, uh, so, so the, the, those limits are three or four. Uh, the democratic organization of the state, the Republican form, the respect for judicial decisions that have been already uh, uh, handed and uh, the respect for international treaties. Many people say that this last one, the respect for international treaties might be more tricky uh, in the sense that some aspects of uh, the neoliberal model are included in free trade agreements and agreements of uh, protection of investments and so on. Uh, in my view, that, that is not the case. Uh, in my view, the, the, the only uh, consequence of this obligation to respect international treaties is that the new constitution cannot declare that under the new constitution, there is this new country that is not binded by uh, the agreements uh, entered into by this old country, Chile, uh, in the former constitution. So, so uh, and, and that is, some, is something that no one is pushing for. So, so those limits uh, exist, but they are not, in my view, a significant limitation of the content of the constitution. Then the question uh, Tom uh, puts is, is relevant. How to decide what to have the constitution? And in my view, the answer to that question is in, the, in, in, in your own formulation, Tom, because you said, because the more you want to put in the constitution, the less agreement you will have. Uh, this will be an effect. I mean, the, the, the answer uh, 
to your question will be, um, uh, the constitution will contain everything that is capable of receiving the assent of two members, two thirds of the members of the convention. Uh, in my view, however, um, this is uh, the, the, what, I, what, what I'm kind of sensing is that the level of uh, consensus towards uh, the content of a new constitution is unexpectedly high. Let me put you an example. One thing that has been um, discussed for 30 years and in which advancement has been very, very difficult and very, very uh, little uh, has been the uh, regulation of uh, rights of, to use water, right? The, cur the current constitution privatizes water, says that uh, uh, people have a, a private property over their rights, rights to use water. And to change, changing that has been impossible because that idea has been defended by uh, the right wing in parliament and so on. And they have uh, in those conditions veto because the constitution, the current constitution cannot be changed through normal reform procedures without their agreement. Uh, but now in the discussion of the content of the new constitution, I don't know, Christina, but I haven't heard anyone, not even the, those who run for the right wing party saying the new constitution should respect private property over rights to use water. So uh, in my view, uh, something that would, would have been or something that was anticipated as highly controversial uh, will not tend to be so controversial. I mean, the, 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 for some reason, uh, this is interesting in itself, the, the, what happened in October and the process that followed from, follow from then and the, the, the tone, the, the, the general kind of uh, uh, conditions of the constitutional discussion have moved the common sense clearly to, to, to the left. I mean, nobody denies that the constitution must protect social rights, though we have been discussing on social rights for the last, I don't know, 15 years. Um, so so I, 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 I think the, the, the constitution, the new constitution will considerably move uh, in this sense to the left, but that won't be particularly uh, controversial. Of course, there will be details and, and there will be high conflict on some issues, I suppose, uh, and, 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 and so on. And, and, and let me say something about the interest in a written constitution. We have no, I mean, we don't have this problem because the idea of not having a written constitution is not part of Chilean constitutional culture. So, so we, we take the idea of a written constitution for granted. Uh, but if I can say something uh, about what made the constitutional issue a central issue in Chilean politics um, is this, in my view, um, constitutional change was not something that came in the first place. It came in the second place. In the first place, what came were social demands of transformation of what I would call the neoliberal model, uh, which in, uh, for, for what I'm talking now means commodification of social rights, you know, the organization of education and healthcare and social security as markets. Um, and since 2006, different social movements, students, uh, trade unions, and so on, have been pushing for a significant reform uh, in order to secure social rights. And they have always um, uh, seen that the constitution itself makes that change impossible. When they realize that those demands could not be met under the current constitution, then the issue for social right, the demand for social right, transformed into a demand uh, for a new constitution. So the question, um, I mean, from the point of view of what, what, what can be learned from other uh, political situations is, in my view, uh, the demand for the new constitution uh, must come in the second place. To, to say that it must come in the second place is not to say that it's not relevant. Of course, I mean, it's the crucial thing. I mean, with the, with, without constitutional change, there won't be any significant change in Chile. But the, the, the social pressure for the new constitution come 
from comes from uh, those demands for environmental protection, for social rights that are uh, um, that must be frustrated under the current constitution. Thank you, Fernando. Sam Bookman, you have a question too. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's just such a wonderful opportunity to ask questions at this really important time. Um, so my question follows up on the exchange between um, the two speakers on environmental protection and the right to a healthy environment. Um, I'm a graduate student who studies the proliferation of the right to a healthy environment. And so, you know, I see the kinds of things that Fernando was talking about quite often that, you know, a right is a declaration, it's very valuable, but it doesn't necessarily translate into, into practical changes. So I was interested in hearing from um, both speakers, what kinds of provisions beyond a right to a healthy environment or something like that um, can be effective in ensuring you know, some kind of practical change in, in the, um, the, the state's approach to environmental issues? Christina, you are a specialist here. Um, yeah, in the in the current constitution, is uh, it didn't say exactly it's a clean uh, the right to, to live in a clean environment. Say it's free of contamination. That is slightly different, and, and actually it's not a slightly different. It's very different because what we means for contamination and, and because currently there are people that live in uh, from the scientific point of view or, or international regulation in, in polluted areas, but for the state. And not polluted because they didn't follow the, the local regulation. So it's something that if apparently is a minor issue, but, but it's not. Uh, actually, this is um, it's a main uh, uh, problem. So how we guarantee that the, the probably rights that will be a guardian nature in the new constitution will be you know real? I think um, have to be th there is now a, a main interest to 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 really make changes regarding the environment. It's one of the most uh, demanded issues in, in the country, together with the social right that we already, we already mentioned. So there is a, a common sense that it's uh, impossible to follow the same economical uh, way that we are now uh, regarding, again, the extractivism. Sorry to mention uh, again, but I think it's important uh, because produce a lot of effect and, and, and effect that are not most of the time considered because uh, the, the centralist uh, way that Chile, Chile works and act um, invisibilize these realities and also give names that for the local people are very strong. For example, sacrifice zones. Here in the north of Chile, there are some territory that call like that because they are, are where there are the polluted, you know, thermoelectrical um, power, power plants and also uh, sulfuric acid plants that all important for the mining because mining is not just to remove minerals from a, from a, from the ground. It's, it's also needs water in the arid desert of the world and its energy. So the final product of that is, is half a, a change of. Um, of effect yeah, in this in this uh, long um, chain of production, so I think uh, it's a cultural change again, uh, and, and at least there are all the conditions to, to to make this major um, uh, point breaking point in in the in the way that we are are, are producing our economies, uh, but also uh, together with the in the ecological constitution also. Not only we include to the right to live in a in a healthy environment uh, and in equilibrium with their ecosystems, also is including the water right that also was mentioned, the um, the recognition of the local knowledge, uh, uh, especially indigenous people that they know very well where they live, and and usually this knowledge is not considered in the decision making, and and again I think it's a recognizement what we know. As, as a common sense again, and put this in practice. Um, I know that uh, that has to be in a, in a legal language and, and everything, but the, the spirit uh, is, is super deep. And I think we can really transition it to, to another um, way to, to do the things uh, with, with really, really care and protection of the ecosystem and the biodiversity. I think you will, you will need some sort of independent body 
to pronounce on environmental projects. Yeah, it, yeah. That also I mean, has to be linked to the to the Yes, have to be linked also to the institution, institution, institutions, no? new institutions that, uh, that uh, take care of that. Mm. Or independent, as you say. Uh, also, we are thinking about the, um, I don't know how to say in English, uh, Defensoria del Medio Ambiente or, or some. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a body, well, a body to protect the environment. To protect yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. May, may I say you. something on this? <laughs> yes, you can, but should because we have four more questions. So go on. <laughs> right, go on, go on. Let's let's go on, and, and I will try to pick. Okay, up. the next question you you, you should answer. It. Uh, Marcos, Marcos Gonzalez, are you there? Uh, hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yes. Yes. Hi. I'm Marcos. I used to be Carlos' classmate, and I'm currently an academic working in between UDP and UCL in London. Um, so my question is that um, how will this new constitution achieve the sort of hegemony that the 1981 did in relation to the Constitución? And is that partly the objective? Because even though the right at the moment is obviously at the weakest, uh, they will at some point in the future be in power again. Thank you. Um. I, I would like to, to, to link my answer to that question, uh, how will the constitution achieve hegemony, uh, with a, a question made before by Mike Gatehouse, uh, because he, he, he asked what is the expected product of the constitutional, of the constituent process? I mean, is, is it just a text? And my answer to that question would be no, it's not a text, it's precisely a change in hegemony. Uh, the constitution is not only a text, I mean, lawyers, uh, tend to think of the constitution uh, 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 as a set of norms, uh, in that sense, a text, but a constitution is much more a, of a text. It's a set of decisions about how to uh, organize uh, political uh, institutions. Um, and, 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 and the, the impact of the current constitution is due to the fact that beyond the text approved by the dictatorship in 1980, it was able to create, uh, so to speak, a kind of um, constitution and political culture that was defined by two elements, in my view. In, in cultural terms, a conservative element, and in political, economic terms, a neoliberal element. And though this constitution, the current constitution, is much more a constitution of cultural conservatism and neoliberalism than the text. Of course, with the text, I mean, and lawyers know this, with the text, I mean, you can, you can uh, do many things. So the, the question is, uh, I mean, Marcus's question is very critical. How will the new constitution create uh, a, a, a political and legal culture that will be significantly different? Uh, and in that sense, it will achieve hegemony. And in my view, I mean, this is, uh, likely to happen for two reasons. reasons. First, as I said before, the kind of common sense in, the, in public discussion has moved clearly away from, uh, from a kind of neoliberal common sense, which was very strong up to relatively recently. Before October 2019, the kind of reforms that the government was pushing through parliament were all neoliberal reforms more uh, flexibility in labor markets, uh, lowering the taxes for the rich, uh, reintroducing selection in publicly funded uh, schools, uh, uh, increase uh, the individual in savings uh, element uh, in social security and so on. And all those reforms uh, that were push, push, pushed by the government before October now, now are, uh, uh, basically forgotten because the common sense has shifted considerably. Uh, that is one element for, uh, for my view that probably the, the new constitution will create a new hegemony on different terms. And the second one is that the first, um, the, the, the constitution, the 1980 constitution uh, was, uh, was uh, or, or the, the, the culture, uh, 
the political and legal culture that surrounds the 1980 constitution and, and constitutes the perspective from which its text is read um, was created during the 80s. And the 80s was in Chile a decade of dictatorship in which public debate and discussion and universities were all um, 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 uh, prevented from um, participating and discussing in, in, in liberty and, and on equal terms. So it's no wonder that uh, the kind of general and most obvious reading of the constitution that arose of those uh, uh, years was conservative and neoliberal. The conditions in which the meaning of the new constitution will have to be transformed in a kind of common sense, common sense in, co in a common sense, in a kind of hegemony, uh, will be considerably, considerably different in these two regards. And for that reason, I think, uh, the, the new constitution will, will be able to, uh, to, to achieve considerably different terms uh, of hegemony uh, in Marcos's uh, sense. Thank you, Fernando. Oh. G. Leslie, um, has, she has a question, I think it's a she. Uh, are you there? Not sure, okay. What can Mapuche expect from constitution and how can lithium be exploited without environmental damage. Cristina? I think you are the right person to answer this. Well, about the Mapuche, I don't know. They, they, I'm not part of the Mapuche community, so I don't, cannot talk about from them. But, but I think it's, it's, super, it's very important, the participation, the constitution of the several um, indigenous people from, from all of Chile. Because it's not only Mapuche in Chile, also are, are Aymara, Quechua, Licananta, Ideaguita, Chango, and many, many others. So, and the question about lithium, um, currently there is no technology that sure that uh, you can extract lithium without using water. That is the main point because uh, the, 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 the that are using to obtain lithium are basically water and salt. Because the, also in Chile, there is a, a, a recognition about what is mining, the brines can be mined and, and it's no water. So they also have uh, maybe opened the, the, the exploitation at a, at a white ranch. But um, this is a, it's super complicated because uh, we have to assume that exploitation of lithium cause uh, damage in the, in the salaries and in the environment. It's, it's not uh, something that we can-, can you explain in, what in, is... any, in, in any case, sorry? Can you explain what is a salar? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Salar is a, is a saline lake. Um, in, the, in the past, here in the in old area of the Atacama and, and the Altiplano in the Andes, they were covered by large paleo lakes that during the time have been drying out because of the evaporation and also uh, shrinked. So now we have these uh, saline lakes that are actually terminal lakes in, in, the, in the geological point of view. So there have been accumulated since millions of years these brines that are enriching lithium. And that's are the ones that are, are pumping out and, and filling these large pools, are so large that you can see from the from this, uh, space in the satellite, and, and, and leave it to evaporate this water and concentrate the lithium. And this is the lithium they're using for batteries. So basically you are but drying out the, the, the system to obtain the lithium. They are very important for electric cars, aren't they? Ah, yeah, they are, they are. They, they, this is a big demand, but that's why also, that was one of the reasons, actually, why I'm here. <laughs> I, I say, well, that can be a, a way to try to save the salaries. <laughs> and, and because uh, the demand is super high and every time, every couple of months appears a new project in a new salar and, and it's really um, uh, something that it, is imparable, I don't know, unstoppable. And, and, but what yeah. sort of system do you have at the moment to protect the salaris. I mean, they're going to there, be exploited, but somehow that has to there, be. There are very few salaris that are located into protected areas. Like, um, actually, Salar de Atacama, this is the one that is exploited currently now in Chile. Half of the salar uh, have uh, protection, and the half that is not protected is the one where happened the exploitation. But of course, the system is only one, so it's connected. Of course, it's, it's causing damage in, in other places. 
and I think we're very far. <laughs> we need to. That's why it's important to put in, in the in the constitution the right of nature and also the recognition of of. That is a very important point because in the constitution of the 1980 uh, explicitly says which places are considered in mind uh, and, and include the salaries. But salaries are not just a, a, a ore of, of, of minerals, they are ecosystem, complex ecosystem. So that is, that is, the, main, that is the main change, I think, to, to see the, the exploitation versus the conservation of nature, to consider it that what we're exploiting is nature. It's not something that uh, is not life or, or something that is no more value than the mineral that contains. Thank, Thank you, you, Christina. Um, Carmen Malari. Carmen. <laughs> Hello. Yes, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Fernando and Christina for being elected as um, members of the Constitutional Convention and also to say uh, as a Chilean in exile to say thank you to them for all the hard work they put into it. Uh, my question is addressed mainly to Fernando who said that there will be popular participation, um, people bringing ideas, um, concerns towards the different aspects of the Constitution how will you channel this concerns from the public? Will there be committees on the main topics to be covered in the discussion? And will this be regional committees, central committees, or how will you divide the, the, the work that the convention is to carry out? Also, will there be, um, Christina mentioned nature, protection of nature, human rights, Will there be um, any statutes within the constitution about how, about the electoral system in Chile? Will there be any reform on that? And uh, like there was, for instance, I seem to remember in the constitution of 1925, there were specific requirements to become a candidate for deputy or for a senator or whoever wanted to apply for that um, job. That, that's my question, please. Um, thank you, Carmen, Carmen, for your congratulations. Um, uh, you are asking for what will the convention decide, right? And, and I have my, my opinions, Christina will have hers, uh, but this is, this is a kind of, uh, to some extent, what I, I would like the convention to decide, and on the other hand, what I predict the convention will probably decide under the circumstances. Um, I don't know why, why will be the specific forms of participation. What I do know is that participation will play a crucial uh, role in the success of the constituent process. So the Given the conversations we have had, which are up to now are just informal conversations, the idea to create something that is capable of channeling the, uh, 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 the conclusions of a myriad of uh, local spaces of discussion, cabildos, local assemblies, and so on. I mean, this idea is being, is being, is, is, is now in, in the process of being transformed in something organized, right? And there are many initiatives, many people thinking about this. Um, and so, so I, I would predict that when the time comes to make a decision in the regulation, in, in, in the regulation for the convention, this will be there, but I don't know what will be the specific form. But of course, the more, the more, the more that, 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 that participation at the local level is being seen as relevant for the constitutional discussion that's being conducted in the convention, the more uh, that will, be, will serve uh, to prop up the success of the constitutional process. Um, uh, Carmen wanted to know how, what commissions you will have because the discussion will have to be divided into Different yeah, that, that, that's also something that has not, has not been decided. That is also that is something for uh, the reglamento as well. Uh, uh, probably there will be uh, commissions linked to different subjects of the constitution. I am just speculating and predicting now, but I suppose, and it wouldn't be surprising 
that there would be uh, that there will be a commission, for example, for the Charter of Rights and commission for uh, uh, the, the the organization of executive and legislative power, uh, commission on uh, general principles of the constitution, but all of this is up to decision for the convention. This is not, this has not been decided in advance. It's something that the convention will have to decide. In my view, one of the critical uh, uh, factors to decide th 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 those issues is how to create a process of discussion and decision on the new constitution that can be easily understood by the people, by the public, that is transparent in the sense that is clear for everybody what is being discussed, where is it's being discussed, and when it's going to be decided. Uh, this transparency, in my view, is important for the same reason that I was said participation is important. Uh, but the details of, of those organizations, of, of the organizational forms, uh, are yet to be decided. Thank you. Christina has something to yeah, say. Yeah, I would like to add something that the also this we don't, we don't know yet how this commission or committee will form, but I think it's super important to to represent the diversity of the assembly. So it cannot be, for example, an uh, only expert talking about the same issue. Otherwise, we will have the same problem that the same people are discussing the same subject and don't they don't include the other realities, especially indigenous people. So it would be very important to, to see that, uh, for example, in a commission about the environment, not only people that know about the environment are discussing about that, but also people from other disciplines and, and with the interculturality as well. So it would be a, a very interesting exercise. And, and regarding the, pardon, sorry, and regarding the participation, uh, we also have met some different organizations of Chileans living abroad, and I think also it's important to include that in the regulation, the reglamento, uh, to have a, a participation open as well for, for Chilean living uh, abroad. That's is very important to also to, to assure them that the right of uh, participation is also in the constitution for, for all Chileans in all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cristina. Fernando, we have three more questions and I think uh, it should be almost all. So Juanita, Simon and Natalia. Uh, Juanita, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the for this panel. It has been amazing to speak with, to have the opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, so my question was regarding if you have thought of any um, pedagogical process during the time of the constitution will be drafted. I'm asking this because uh, in the case of Colombia, for example, I know it's different, but in the during the peace process, we had kind of lots of uh, fake news and misinformation and misleading information regarding uh, the agreement. And I fear that that might happen uh, in your constitutional process. So I wonder if, I, I, want, I wanted to know if you have thought of any pedagogy process to kind of answer the, que the questions that citizens may have uh, on the points that the convention reach reaches uh, agreements. Fernando? Well, a pedagogical process. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yes, I, I think th there is some concern about that as well. Uh, uh, I would Both of that... you are, are professors, so. <laughs> yeah. no, but I, I would link that to, to uh, again, to the conditions for the, for, for the success of the constituent process. I, I, I said uh, the, main, the main condition would be participation because the convention should be seen as open uh, and uh, uh, as open to the public and the discussion in the convention should be seen as a mirror image of the discussion that is uh, occurring at local level. Uh, for that, uh, there has been some discussion about transparency and the publicity of, uh, of the discussion in the convention. Some people said before the election, I think this idea has uh, no purchase value now at all, but some people said before that some, some, some spaces of the convention should be reserved, which is the word, the, the word they use instead of, seeing, of, of, of saying secret. 
Uh, that, in my view, would have been a, a, a terrible discussion. I mean, it would have been exactly what we don't need. But, and, and I mentioned this in response to Juanita's question, because the point is not only to make the convention transparent in the sense that the discussion is, I don't know, appears on YouTube or something like that. That is important, but it's not enough. There must be something, a, 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 a conscious effort to explain what is going on in the convention so that anyone, everyone can understand it. Because uh, when you, when some, sometimes you, you see the reports of what's going on in politics and you almost have to be a lawyer in order to understand it. Uh, that's another way to exclude people. Uh, and an inclusive process is a process that, um, that, that makes a conscious effort to be understandable by everybody. Uh, and uh, to do that, uh, th this is what I take the, your point to be, Juanita, uh, that a pedagogical process, I, I would say a way to communicate what is going on uh, is, is especially important. And, and, and this, is, this is considered something that, 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 that will be relevant. Again, there, there, there are no decisions yet on this, no specific forms of action, but uh, co consciousness of the importance of the topic. Yeah, next. Next, um, Simon. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Fernando. We have mainly talked about one of the things that, uh, like, we have the right to live in an environment free of pollution. And just recently, uh, Dr. Cristina Dorador just mentioned something like uh, one of her motivations to be part of this uh, constitutional process was like uh, giving a voice for, uh, for Salard, right? So, my question is. Uh, what about uh, to include at a uh, constitutional level uh, these like ecological rights for the environment and not only for, for us? Yeah, it's something that we are, we are proposing, the right of nature. How will it work? Ah, how it will work? Mm. <laughs> There's an example of other constitution that I have, also inc have included. And it's something that again we need to discuss uh, uh, because it's, it's one it's one of the of the way I think that uh, the system can be effectively protected because currently the, our, our environmental system is not uh, not have this purpose to protect the environment have the purpose to do it the, the project uh, having some certain regulations. But it, in the spirit, it's not to protect the, the environment. That's why we we see in the, the high level of environmental degradation in all the country. So even the, the, the wanted to have a project uh, that destroy glaciers, for example, that are the reserve of water that we have. So it's something that have to stop and, and, and slow down because it's um, it's a very high and massive extractivism. Yeah. So you really want to change the Chilean model of development, which is the same model that every country in Latin America has and has had since about 500 years. I think we need to, we need to think over the extractivism. That's why we propose to go to a post-extractivism. It's, it's not even a question if you have to, to follow the same or not. We need mm. to change. All of, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing of surviving. We, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the context that we, ha we have, it's, it's, it's no other, other way. We, we cannot just put the, 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 the world sustainable or green to change the things. Because the, most of the economy of Chile is based on, on their natural products, yeah, on the natural resources. So we don't have other ways. So that's why we need to prepare from now to the future. And on, well, this is present, but also to the future. Otherwise, uh, I don't want us to, to think about a, a very, very dark very future for, for especially for, for current for the future generations yeah thank you christina so the last two questions um natalia great uh thanks a lot so this is just a shameful kind of promotion of a, a complementary event to what you're discussing i hear a lot about 
uh, nature's rights, uh, development model, interculturality, indigenous rights as well. So this is exactly what we'll be discussed tomorrow in an event about the Constituent Assembly and the Mapuche movements at Oxford. Uh, so I just wanted to draw that to your attention. Um, uh, Veronica Figueroa and Fernando Pairican, two Chilean scholars, but also Elisa Loncon, who is an elected member uh, of the Constituent Assembly, will be with us uh, discussing the cycle this and, and also comparisons with other constitutions like the Ecuadorian one or the Bolivian one. So just that, and I'll, I'll drop the link there. But thanks so much for organizing this. This has been so instructive and, and interesting. Thanks. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, that sounds really interesting. Uh, Veronica, Fernando um, are very good scholars too. So uh, G. Leslie has another question. She was off. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, I did have, um, so when it comes to the uh, abuse of, um, of, of people's rights by the police shooting, and blinding um, and people in the demonstrations and that would seem uh, a vital thing to actually thoroughly um, reconstitute the way that policing takes place in, in Chile. Do you think that can be, well, I think you said you needed a two-thirds majority. Do you think that's, that's an achievable um, objective so that, uh, and, and for there to be people held to account for what they've done? The other thing I asked earlier, or before I went away, was whether or not there's any possibility of having um, a restoration of land taken from the Mapuche and restitution for uh, their mistreatment over the years, whether something like that can be dealt with. I suppose the environmental issues in my absence have been dealt with with regard to, well, the uh, lithium being extracted from the salt flaps and uh, salt flats, which are going to cause desperate environmental damage right. apart from depriving people of water. Anyway, the first yeah, two probably. dealt with was in some detail a few minutes ago. Okay. Um, so the land, the police, yes, I think the question is whether there will be some system of control, of civilian control over the police, because it seems that they have been like a kind of completely independent apparatus and not, are not answerable to the authorities, except in very, very extreme circumstances. Fernando? Fernando. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, 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 that's the situation. I mean, uh, two years ago, Jose Miguel Insulza, who was uh, a very important politician, former Ministry of Defense and in, uh, of Home Office, of the Chilean Home Office and so on, uh, he said, <laughs> he said, since 1990, the armed force and the police have uh, been subject only to themselves. <laughs> and I think this, this, it, it, this points to the basic problem we have. I'm part of the settlement, I mean, the more the formal or informal settlement uh, that made the transition, that made possible the transition from the dictatorship to democracy was apparently to um, leave the armed forces and the police outside of civilian control. In fact, not in law, of course. I mean, legally, they were subject to uh, uh, some civilian authority, but in fact, they, they were out of civilian control. Just, just to put an example uh, of, of, of the importance of this, for many, many years, up to a couple of years ago, uh, the Armed for the, the budget of the armed force was funded by a special law uh, that destined to military expenditure 10% of the sales of Codelco, the, the Chilean state mining company. Notice 10% of the sales, not 10% of the utilities, 10% of the sales. And the armed forces received 10% of the sales of Codelco when, when copper was under $1 a pound, and they kept receiving, without any political discussion, they kept receiving the same 10% when copper was more than $4 a pound. So this was a, an enormous amount of money, uh, and this points to the autonomy uh, they have had, in fact, um, in that the, the budget has not been to uh, gone through parliament as any other public uh, agency or body does, and so on. 
and the, with the police is more or less the same. Uh, uh, so the uh, and this has led the police to develop their own uh, ways of action and patho institutional pathologies. There has been corruption and scams and so on. Uh, so uh, in my view, uh, the new the new constitution must make must must ensure uh, that uh, armed forces and the police are really subject to civilian control. Probably that are uh, that have civilian uh, members in the higher ranks um, in order to actually uh, control them. I mean, uh, this is not going to be easy, but on the other hand, uh, the, 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 the strength of the armed forces as a political actor has diminished greatly over the years, in my view. So uh, of course they, they still retain, retain them, they have the weapons after all, but 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 it's 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 a, a ability to act uh, in a, in order to obtain their political goal the, their goals in politics has been greatly reduced, and for that reason I I think that um, it will be possible for the new constitution to to um, uh, make significant advances in 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 this sense. Yeah. I mean, in, can I, as a, as a short writer, in the case of abuse of force by the police, who are they answer, under the present circumstances, who are they answerable to? Well, one, one would expect that abuse of force has uh, uh, two components. On the one hand, one would expect that that would lead to criminal prosecution. <laughs> And there has been there has been some prosecution, but, but very few cases. And that, that, then it, that that's a problem, and that's a problem of the operation of the criminal justice system and the ministerio público, the public prosecution service, and so on. There, there is a problem there. Um, but on the other hand, one would expect that abuse of force in, in in the repression of political demonstrations would have a political consequences for someone, for some authority. Uh, there has been some impeachment. That there was the impeachment of one uh, home minister, um, um, uh, but but in general, the political consequences of the ways in which the police acts in political demonstrations are reduced, um, uh, and that contributes to this situation in some in which sometimes you see the police behaving in ways that are uh, basically out of control. So you think that needs to be not you know, obviously uh, civilian control, but also an independent commission outside of of, um, of the Home Office, uh, wholly um, outside and wholly uh, a number of respected human rights representatives to ensure that allegations can be properly investigated and prosecuted. That would seem to be necessary since there has been so much uh, uh, abuse over the years, would you not think? Uh, well, I don't want to monopolize this and maybe Christina has something to say about this. Just, just to add one, one tiny thing. Uh, there, there was, I mean, there was a body that was supposed to be that autonomous or semi-autonomous organ that would be able to do this, which was the Instituto de Derechos Humanos, uh, the Human Rights National Institute. Um, but uh, that has shown its it, its shortcomings uh, and the, the the way in which uh, it has been uh, politically neutralized by the composition of its count, its governing council and so on. So the idea of uh, some kind of human rights protecting protection agency that has some form of autonomy in the new institutional system, una defensoria, as Christina said, um, I think I, I think is very much. On the constitutional agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just to, to add something in this, this discussion, I think not only we, we need to have clear in the constitution that the, the police need to have a, a citizen control, but also we need to reform the police because the that's the same people that come from dictatorship. So they have practices that have never changed. So and also uh, if we include the decentralization. And the autonomy of the territories probably also will have a different police for every territory. And that I think will decrease 
the corruption and also we decrease the, the centralized power that also produce uh, those uh, main problems, you know, of uh, injustice and all of the rest that we have, we have listened. So, and also we need a professional police or police are not professional. Not, I, I, I have been in the UK many times for a long time and it's very different. Um, so yeah, we need a, a major change in that. So I think we are finishing, David. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank Carla, you. for your sharing. Thank you very much, Christina. To Christina and, and Fernando. You've been, you've been very committed and we will follow you with enthusiasm. <laughs> and, yes. And we will have hopefully more, more meetings like this where we will accompany the, con the Constitutional Convention's work. And, and you, you can tell, yeah, you can tell us later, uh, nine months later, maybe, uh, how was this process? <laughs> um, and thank you for being here. And also, you can you can have all our support uh, in this very very important process for Chile and for the rest of Latin America too. Sorry, thank did you me. address the, the the Mapuche question earlier? Uh, when I asked about the restitution of lands and reparation, is that something? Wait for the next event. But yeah. Or tomorrow, they have another event about Mapuche. Yeah, there's an event yeah. here, yeah. In Oxford. Yeah. So if thank you, you everybody. Yeah. If you look well, on thank the... you. Thank you for the invitation. I hope that we will be able in the future to have a discussion in past tense about the constituent <laughs> process. And I hope it will be in person. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank wow. you. Okay.